everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Very glad you can all be here today. I'd like to remind you of what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1 says. It says this, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Now, uh, just a reminder to come to God's house reverently. Not to be joyful and glad to be in God's house, but it's, it's very important that we come with reverence. And it's my responsibility to lead the worship with reverence and with joy, but it is every church member's responsibility to come prepared, to come ready to hear from God's word, and sing praise to God. Excuse me, sing praise to God, which is why we're here. So if you would, let's have you stand to take a hymnal, turn to number 665. <laughs> Number 296.
Amen. Well, good morning. You may be seated. It's a joy to be here together with you. And uh, I hope that you are as thankful as I am for the cross of Jesus Christ and for what he did there many years ago uh, on our behalf. I appreciate what Jonathan said just about coming to God's house prepared, reverent, ready to hear from him. And I uh, pray that that's the case in each of your hearts as well. And uh, we've got a lot of wonderful things that are ahead today. Very much appreciate the study in the last hour that we enjoyed together. And uh, very practical, very helpful. And uh, I don't think it was intended to kind of uh, work around Valentine's Day here in, in particular as we talk about um, relationships. Maybe Brother Jed did plan that. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's been really good and, and really helpful. So thank you for that. But uh, as we move on throughout the day today, a couple of things that are just slightly different in our schedule. Um, this afternoon, we typically have our small groups uh, that break out at 1.30 on Sunday afternoons. We're not going to do that today. I have a couple of deacons that we're installing here um, to serve in the church. And so we're all going to meet collectively right here in the auditorium at 1.30 this afternoon after lunch. And so, sorry kids, um, it's probably a, a groan of, uh, of depression from the kids about that. But no, it, it'll be good for everybody to be here and to witness and to be a part of and be able to observe. And so um, please, uh, please be here for that. And we very much look forward to what's going to take place there as we uh, recognize and install these men into that important position. And then uh, th throughout the day, please be in prayer for the ministry, of course, at Fort Wainwright. We'll be leading a service there this evening. And, um, and we def definitely need the Lord's direction, his assistance, his help in that ministry. And uh, I've been very um, blessed, of course, as you all know, to be able to, uh, to serve there, serve many of our soldiers, and um, provide some spiritual ministry. And I'm thankful for that. And of course, we have a number of our folks that are out in the field this week, so keep them in prayer. It's been our prayer over the last few weeks that the Lord will uh, open up doors of opportunity for them to be able to minister to many people as they're serving out in that austere environment. And, uh, and we need to keep praying for that um, until they are back here with us next week. So anyway, um, with that being said, we do have a couple of guests that are here with us this morning, and I'm going to give an opportunity to uh, one of my counterparts uh, here in the 11th Airborne Division to be able to talk. He just asked for a minute or two to be able to talk to the church and express a, a few sentiments. And so a um, friend of mine, uh, Phil Rittermeyer, uh, so if, if you'd like to come, it might be a little easier if you just talk at the microphone up here so we can make sure everybody can hear you. Now, come on up, brother. Hey, thank you all very much. I just wanted a moment to say thank you on behalf of the 11th Airborne Division for sharing this great man with us. I have the privilege of serving as the division chaplain, but I couldn't do what I do without the support of your pastor. So Monday through Friday, he puts on a uniform and comes to work, and he does things here at Fort Wainwright that are making an extremely positive impact for the kingdom of God through the army of the United States. And that is not lost on our commanding general, uh, Major General Eifler, and it's not lost on the soldiers and, and uh, family members of Fort Wainwright. Many of you know, as we have struggled through uh, what has really become an epidemic of suicide in the Army, that Alaska was hit harder than most locations. And I cannot begin to tell you the difference, Chaplain uh, Pastor Mc <laughs> Phil, we'll just call him Phil if that's okay with you. We, I can't begin to tell you the difference that he and his team have made for us. Uh, we only, and I say only, we had four deaths by suicide last calendar year. And compared to where we were when we started, that is a huge uh, decrease. That is a win for the kingdom. Because while the Army is throwing money and programs and all these things at this problem, we know what the issue is and we are attacking it at its root source, and that is through prayer and just pleading the blood of Jesus over the uh, service members and family members of our unit and of Alaska as a whole. And Phil's influence and Phil's work is no small part of that, and the sacrifice that you all are making by letting us have your senior pastor most of the week is also not lost. So thank you all very much. We appreciate you, and we appreciate uh, you lending us this great servant of the Lord. Thank you. All right. Um, well, we will uh, we'll go ahead and prepare to, to take up our tithes and offerings here, and, and I always just try to express this is for the members of our church here. We don't expect visitors to give, but it's our opportunity to be able to obey the Lord through the giving of our tithes, and then um, provision of offerings for missionary work around the world and through the community as well. And so let's prepare our hearts to that. It's an important part of our corporate worship. And then we'll continue on with some songs this morning. Would you bow with me? 
Our Father, um, we give you thanks, and we give you all the glory and praise for anything good that's accomplished in and through our lives. We recognize, as this song stated that we just sang a moment ago, that, uh, that it was at the cross, uh, the cross on which our Savior hung and bled and died and gave his life for us, that we have um, the way made in which we can enter into your presence and we can have reconciliation with you and then we can have a spiritual life and life more abundantly. And we give you thanks for that this morning. And we seek to turn all of our attention and our focus upon our Savior today. I pray that he would be magnified, that he'd be lifted up through our worship together in everything that we do. Thank you that we're given the blessing of being able to lift up our voices in song and praise to him that you've placed a new song in our hearts um, through bringing us into a relationship with yourself. And Lord, we also thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to give. Uh, we recognize this morning that your word calls us to be good and wise stewards of the things that you've entrusted to us. And that's not just limited to financial resources, but every area of our lives, including our health and our time, our priorities, our ambitions, our relationships, uh, our spiritual service, and of course our finances as well. And I pray that you might find us all being wise and faithful stewards and as we come to this time, as you've called us as a church body in particular to bring our tithes and our offerings before you and present them, I pray that you might find us presenting them with joyful hearts. Uh, we know that your word teaches that you love a cheerful giver, uh, someone who is exuberant about their giving as we recognize this all belongs to you anyway. And I pray that you would utilize the offerings that are given today to sustain the, the needs of this church and its ministry throughout this community and our outreach throughout the world and missionary um, support. And we pray that you would uh, especially bless us richly with your presence in everything that we do here today. May our hearts be humble before you, completely yielded and submitted in all ways, that you'd be able to continue to speak to us and minister to the deepest needs of our lives in and through the power of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs> Take our hymnals, if you would, and turn to number 405. Number 405. Hey! 
you stand one more time if you would we're going to turn to number 352 number 352 we sing now i belong to jesus Return. 
Well, please open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, if you don't have a Bible with you, then there should be a few that are in the um, book racks that are very near you in the seats. Um, But we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get their eyes on God's Word. That's the most important thing today and always is that you see what God has to say. And Lord willing, we're going to be finishing up Philippians chapter 2 today. Um, Before I read the text, I'm going to set the stage just a little bit for you. By saying this, um, we live in a culture that's often fixated on heroes. And uh, for the past several generations, there have been myriads of books and TV shows and movies depicting larger-than-life superheroes, uh, men who can crush cars with their bare hands and move faster than speeding bullets and shoot lasers out of their eyeballs and all kinds of crazy ethereal stuff, right? Uh, Of course, in the midst of our current feminist world, Um, There has to be an equivalent number of superhero women um, who somehow can do as much and more than all of the superhero men. And so that's the the big rage of our current trend now. And and many boys and girls and even men and women idolize these fictional characters. Watching them with fascination, dressing up like them, um, mimicking them in various ways. We're not just fixated on superheroes. Um, often superstar athletes as well. And uh, when I was growing up, I didn't really care too much about superheroes, but athletic heroes were a big focus. I enjoyed watching sports and playing sports. Uh, I particularly loved watching the Dallas Cowboys destroy all of their opponents and win three out of four Super Bowls between 1993 and 1996. Uh, Of course, they haven't done a whole lot but disappoint ever since that time, but I don't really want to talk about that today, okay? Okay. I was in awe during that time in my life of true basketball greats during that era like Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and many others as well. And of course, who's not inspired by thinking about some of our national heroes, especially military service members who have performed remarkable acts of valor and selfless service on the battlefield. It really gets our uh, our hearts wound up when we think about that in American culture. But moving closer to home, all of us very likely have some real down-to-earth heroes whom we look up to. People who've touched our lives in very special ways. In fact, uh, as as much as we might get somewhat dreamy about some of the bigger-than-life heroes, our hearts are really moved and really inspired when it comes to everyday heroes and the things that they accomplish just through their faithfulness, through their integrity, through their consistency, through their courage, and, and real depth. And it might be a son or daughter looking up in admiration and thankfulness to a parent. It might be grateful citizens looking in appreciation to its military service members. It might be a person looking up to a treasured mentor who has impacted his or her life in a very special way. And I have no doubt today that all of us are fascinated by greatness in whatever areas really interest us. And and I'll tell you this, that it's especially true in spiritual service. It ought to be. The passion of our hearts and the heroes to whom we look as Christians should not be cheesy Hollywood action stars or overpaid babies who throw a ball around instead of working. Our hearts should not primarily cling to political or to military leaders, but to real heroes and real mentors who faithfully serve the Lord Jesus Christ. As parents, uh, our proudest And yet humblest moments should be when our children look up with admiration at men and women of God. And they aspire to follow in their footsteps of faithful, courageous service to the Lord. 
I'll never forget the day when uh, I walked past uh, my son Jesse's school desk. One day he was about uh, nine or ten years old, and I saw that he had built a display of all of his personal heroes. And he'd sit there uh, during the school day, and he'd look up and daydream about those heroes. And as I stopped and I looked at it, I noticed that they were all missionaries. They were all uh, preachers of different eras about whom we'd read in family devotions. And that was a wonderful moment as a father. And if I can invest anything at all in my children, I desire that it would be a love for Jesus Christ following in the footsteps of faithful men in his ministry. I hope that if you're a parent that that's what really strikes your fascination as well in what you build into your children. And the first two chapters of the book of Philippians have set before us some amazing heroes of the faith. In chapter 1, we got to see a window into Paul's greatness. Tremendous man of God who dedicated his life to following the Lord. No matter what he had to sacrifice, that was his focus in life. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, emphasize the glory of Jesus Christ. There is no greater example than that. And of course, last week, as we just expositorily have moved through this book, we studied the character of a young man named Timothy. And in this study today, we're going to look at a final hero who's mentioned in the book of Philippians. And Paul held up what we would probably say is a relatively insignificant and obscure man as one deserving of a hero's welcome. And so beginning in verse 25 of Philippians chapter 2, let's read today's text. It says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. And you may have noticed as I read through that that this portion of scripture is filled with personal details, which can be a little bit confusing to piece together at first glance if you're not familiar with this with this story. And so um, as we very frequently um, try to do, we want to set the context well so that we understand exactly what he was talking about. And so I want to begin by laying out chronologically, first of all, just a brief story of Epaphroditus. Now, the Philippians, from what we find in Scripture, sent this man named Epaphroditus to deliver a gift and to minister to Paul while he awaited trial in Rome. So it's his first trial. Remember that the Philippians um, sent him to deliver that gift in order to provide for Paul's needs while he was in prison awaiting that trial. And they intended also for Epaphroditus to stay with Paul for an extended period of time in order to minister to Paul's practical needs. However, our text tells us, um, first of all, that Epaphroditus became severely ill, but he pressed forward until he almost died, right? So verse 27 tells us, indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. And we don't know what kind of illness he had, but it was a bad one. We'll just leave it at that, right? And verse 30 indicates that Epaphroditus probably complicated his illness by not resting and not caring for himself enough when he first got sick because he was that determined to complete his mission. He was that serious about it. He says in verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And that statement, not regarding his life, indicates that he probably became ill while traveling from Philippi to Rome. Um, However, rather than stopping to rest or turning around and going back home for recovery, he continued on with a very physically demanding trip. And by the time he reached Rome and he reached Paul, he was almost dead. And the Philippians then got word of Epaphroditus' illness. And he assumed that they were anxious about his health. That is, Epaphroditus assumed this about the Philippians because they were so close to one another in that church. And verse 26 says that Paul knew that the Philippians heard about Epaphroditus' health issues. 
And even though Paul was awaiting trial and Epaphroditus was fighting for his life, remarkably, they were both full of heaviness, according to the, the scripture. Um, and, and they were full of heaviness because they assumed that the Philippians were worried about Epaphroditus. And, and that just tells me a little bit about the kind of men that these were. It, it's kind of like when you visit a godly saint who's severely ill or going through a struggle and when you get there, you intend to go and encourage them, but they just want to know how you're doing and how the ministry is going and how they can encourage you. And so they end up blessing you a whole lot more than you end up blessing them in that visit. And that's kind of the picture that I see here with Paul and Epaphroditus. But thankfully, we find next that God healed Epaphroditus. Verse 27 says simply, but God had mercy on him. Now, apparently, Paul himself was sure that Epaphroditus was going to die. It was that serious. And frankly, that's typically what happened in the ancient world when people became severely ill. Until just the advent of modern medicine and more recent times, it was not uncommon at all for people, especially in the, the tropical regions of the world, the Mediterranean, to die on a very regular basis and to die very young. But God healed Epaphroditus. And by the time Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he had fully recovered. And, and that was great, but it left Paul with a really difficult decision. And ultimately, we find next that Paul decided to send Epaphroditus home early and to send the letter of Philippians with him, the book that we're reading now. And, and again, the original plan was for Epaphroditus to stay with Paul for an extended time, but Paul and Epaphroditus both knew that the, the Philippians probably thought that Epaphroditus was dead and that they would be deeply grieving, and that it might be a distraction to them in the ministry in some ways. And Paul could also see that Epaphroditus himself was greatly burdened to share with his church family what God had done in his life. And so Paul makes the decision to send Epaphroditus home early, and of course he figured that he'd send along some kind of explanation to the church also. And specifically, he wanted them to know that Epaphroditus had been deathly sick, that it was his, that is Paul's decision to send Epaphroditus home early, and that Epaphroditus had not bailed early on Paul. And he was faithful, and he was faithful to the extreme. And verse 25 says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow, fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So Paul um, took the, the proactive action to send him back, and Paul also took the opportunity to, uh, to write an extended letter addressing the issues that the Philippians were facing. And of course, we hold in our hands today the very letter that he wrote at that opportunity. And, and I just bring all of that up so you have, again, some of the historical background. But, but from a very practical standpoint, it's pretty remarkable to me to consider how God worked providentially through an entire series of events to provide us with this letter that we're studying today. God used a difficult journey a fatal illness, a miraculous recovery, some deep sorrow and trouble in some people's hearts, and troubles at the church in Philippi to give churches for all ages this necessary piece of our Bibles. And if you're anything like me, then um, it's probably pretty hard to imagine the New Testament without this letter. It's a good reminder to me that um, uh, just really of God's incredible ability to use what may appear to be random or senseless or terrible circumstances as we view them to accomplish his good and perfect purpose. God is able to do that. And, and so I want to remind you at the outset today that just because we can't see what God is doing, that doesn't mean that he's not working for his glory and in some ways even for our own good through those poor circumstances. And so for anybody that's here, if you're weighed down today by things that you don't understand, keep trusting the Lord. He has a good plan. He's got things in his control, even if you can't see it. And so Paul's purpose in our text was um, to boast about Epaphroditus' service and to explain why he sent him home early. Those are the specifics of it. And so Paul had a very practical goal with our text. Uh, however, in the process of explaining that, he provided us with an inspired example from which I find that we should make at least three important applications for our own lives. And so the first of those three practical applications as they abide for us today is that we must work together. All right. And, and again, my primary audience is Christians and saved people and, and particularly the members of True North Baptist Church. But um, but understand this, we must work together. Uh, God is never, ever, ever intended for his work to be done alone. 
Individuals are called by God to salvation, and then they are called into a church assembly to work together to glorify God as part of a church body, right? That's what we see from beginning to end as we look at the New Testament. And churches then are also called by God to work together for the sake of his ministry throughout the world. And of course, we've talked about that theme a lot in the last two chapters of Philippians, or rather the first two chapters of Philippians, but God wants to emphasize it to us one more time here, right? And so notice, first of all, as we consider the need to work together, um, the Philippians service, right? Now, I find it very interesting that Paul described the ministry of the Philippians and the ministry of Epaphroditus very specifically here. He didn't merely say that the Philippians did something nice or thoughtful or meaningful, but instead, verse 25 says, they ministered to my wants. And the word ministered was often used in the Old Testament for priestly service in the temple. And, uh, and then, of course, it's carried over into the New Testament to just speak of, uh, of service and servitude within a church body in particular and service for the Lord. And here, in this context, it emphasized the Philippians' obligation to care for Paul and for the work of God's kingdom. And similarly, verse 30 says that through Epaphroditus, they supplied your lack of service or ministry toward me. And so um, the, the reality is this. Paul needed the assistance. He needed the finances in a very practical way because Rome didn't feed or clothe prisoners. And, uh, and so there were some desperate physical temporal needs in Paul's life. And Paul also needed the fellowship of godly men. And the Philippians had a duty to care for this servant of God, who was also their spiritual father in many ways. He had been there at the beginning. He had helped to start to plant that church for the Lord. And, uh, and so they looked up to him in that way. And the Philippians stepped up to the plate as they looked at that need. Even though the Philippians were a, an incredibly poor congregation, and we learn that as we piece together the book of Acts and uh, Corinthians and a few other places in the scripture, these, these churches of Macedonia, which was northern Greece where Philippi was located, were incredibly impoverished. And they're, they're deeply praised by Paul and some other texts of scripture for their liberality and for their selfless giving to the, to the cause of the ministry and to missionary service and even to helping other churches that were more affluent but that were going through some struggles. And so these are people that are from a very poor congregation, but yet they put together a generous gift and they sent a member of their own church on an 800 mile journey for several months to serve Paul in his time of need. It's pretty serious. And in the process, they provided to us an important model. First, of how we need to care for each other. Uh, we need to care well for the spiritual and the practical needs of this church body. We need to lean on each other. And also, the Philippians challenge us about our need to serve our fellow ministers well. Paul was clear that our missionaries have needs. They have needs physically, they have needs spiritually, they have needs emotionally, and we are obligated to care for those. All of us, again, I'm speaking to the membership of True North Baptist, all of us need to embrace this duty to care for God's ministers. And we are obligated, when I just think about a missionary context in particular, we're obligated financially. And God has given us financial resources in our culture and in our area beyond the comprehension of most people throughout the world's history. And of course, as you folks know, each year I challenge all of the members of this church, every single one, to pledge the monthly amount that they'll commit to God for the cause of missions around the world so that we can provide for the real tangible needs of missionaries and their families. That is a good service, and I want to encourage each of you to be faithful to honor the commitments that you've made to the Lord in that realm. I also want to challenge anybody here who's not stepped up to the plate to do so, because again, we see this example that, that clearly shines through in this passage of Scripture about the need um, for that, and, and uh, we have pledge cards for missions right here in the church lobby, uh, and if you commit to filling one of those out, if you've not done so already and participating, um, then, then please make sure that that's um, brought to the church staff so that we can add it to the other obligations that are already made by other church members, and that's really important because we want to meet our obligations, we want to meet our commitments to missionaries, and um, we want to give sacrificially to the Lord for those missionaries. Um, beyond that, beyond the financial aspect of it, pray continually for our missionaries. 
Lift them up before the Lord in prayer regularly. And of course, also in our age, we can very easily send letters of encouragement and notes to people. Almost everybody, even in the most remote areas, have access to email and to electronic communications platforms. And being able to, to reach out to them in real time is a wonderful privilege that we have that most throughout the world's history have not had. If you think about even a case like what we're considering today, you have Epaphroditus that had to travel 800 miles and carry a letter by hand for months just to get that to Paul. We don't have uh, that limitation, um, and yet we often still neglect that. And so I encourage everybody in this congregation to be very communicative with the missionaries and their families that we're partnered with and be a, an encouragement to them in that way. Um, frankly, we can even visit a lot easier than Epaphroditus uh, could. And so I challenge you to think about your responsibility in this area and our church's responsibility in this area and embrace it. Embrace it joyfully and embrace it liberally. Um, but let's not just think about the Philippians service as a church, but more specifically, I also want to consider Epaphroditus's sacrifice, his, his personal sacrifice and service as a member of that church. And it's worth noting here that Epaphroditus was not some famous, highly gifted leader with a great background. He was almost assuredly born into deep paganism. His name, Epaphroditus, is literally derived from the Greek goddess of fertility, Aphrodite. He didn't have Christian roots. He was not born of good stock. And he wasn't raised in a Christian home. He wasn't raised in a church like many people here have been privileged to enjoy. Also, the only place that he's mentioned in the New Testament is right here in this letter of Philippians. <clears throat> and so I bring all that up, folks, just to mention and emphasize that he was just a regular guy who was saved by God's grace out of an obscure pagan background. And he was intensely committed to his church. But he was available for ministry. In fact, in this case, and who knows how many others, he sacrificed many months of work and of his life to make this trip. And he was committed to his servants, service to the Lord and to the Lord's men. In fact, he was so determined so fixated on fulfilling his duty that he about killed himself in the process. And so just imagine this man who was deathly ill with some unnamed disease, limping to the finish line of an 800-mile journey. His church gave him a job. The Lord gave him a job. And he was, de he was determined to get that gift to Paul and to continue to help and serve God's minister however he could. A tremendous example. And as a result, in verse 25, Paul proudly called him a fellow soldier. Paul knew that he could count on Epaphroditus in the heat of battle. He would hold the line. He would stay in his position. He would have Paul's back no matter the cost. What a testimony. Now, of course, the, the point that I'm trying to make is not that you should run yourself into the ground. Uh, Paul never said that. And he wasn't specifically praising that. Uh, and we need to be wise and we need to set ourselves up for sustainable ministry, not burnout. But we should imitate Epaphroditus' resolve in being faithful to the ministry that's committed to him and his willingness to sacrifice absolutely anything necessary to accomplish it for the Lord, for his church, for the Lord's men. All right? And so let me ask you this today. Are you committed to this church and to our mission that the Lord's given us, like Epaphroditus was committed to his church and to his mission. Are you eager and ready to serve wherever you're able? You know, just as this church um, here at True North Baptist needs men like Timothy, as we considered last week, this church needs men and women like Epaphroditus too. People who may not have a doctorate in theology or impressive talents or flashy capabilities but who are committed and who are faithful. And let's not miss Paul's deep appreciation of Epaphroditus. Notice how Paul described Epaphroditus in verse 25. First, he called him my brother. Now, of course, this is the most basic description of relationships amongst Christians, those who have been born into God's family. But just because it's a basic description doesn't mean that it's not packed with meaning and with heart. And it speaks to the fact that we all share the same grace, 
given to us by God through his son Jesus Christ. It speaks to the fact that we all share the same father. And we love each other since we're in the same family. Paul loved Epaphroditus. And he was so thankful for the service that he had rendered and for the fellowship that they enjoyed together. It meant everything. But secondly, he called Epaphroditus my companion in labor. Now, from a normal human perspective, Paul and Epaphroditus were not equals. Paul was a preeminent apostle, and Epaphroditus, from what we can see, is a relatively obscure and humble messenger boy of a church. But that's not how Paul saw it. He saw Epaphroditus as an equal, as a precious and valuable teammate in the service of the Lord. And it's a wonderful depiction for us of the spiritual giftings even within a church and how God's designed every member to provide critically necessary functions. They're desperately needed. And Paul knew in his case that he needed people like Epaphroditus. He treasured him. And so the Philippians and Epaphroditus and Paul, all three of them set an important example in this passage of mutual support and interdependent team function in the work of the Lord's ministry. And they remind us that we all need each other desperately. Now the Christian life and the Great Commission are not designed for anyone to go alone. In fact, it's not possible to successfully go those things alone. We need to lean on each other to reach our community and to make disciples and to grow into stronger disciples ourselves and to be an effective church for the Lord. And this example also reminds us that each of us are obligated to care well for fellow ministers. We don't just say, be warmed and filled, as it says in, in James. We don't just say, you know, as we typically see on social media, thoughts and prayers, right? That basically means, I'm not doing anything for you, right? And, uh, and that's frequently what ends up happening. But there's an obvious financial side to this. In the words of verse 25, every one of God's people have a priestly duty to contribute to the work of the ministry. But also, we need to care well for the souls of our fellow ministers, for, for the, uh, the mental well-being and the emotional state of those ministers. We need to pray for them. We need to encourage them. We need to visit them. We need to analyze how we can send our own messengers out to be a help to our missionaries. And so that's the first uh, practical application. Simply this. We need each other. And, and there is a collaborative team effort that's required if we're going to do this mission well that God's given to us. Yeah. Secondly... Um, second major application we need to make from this passage is that we must sincerely love each other. And I'm going to really underscore the word sincerely. You know, mutual love dominates this entire paragraph that we read in this text of Scripture. Um, but love especially dominates verses 26 through 28. And I want you to notice first uh, how Paul and the Philippians grieved for Epaphroditus. Verse 27 describes the depth of Paul's concern for Epaphroditus during his illness and how significant it was to Paul when he recovered. For indeed, he was nigh, or sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, of course, uh, Paul had plenty of his own problems while he was in prison, and yet he was deeply troubled when he saw how sick Epaphroditus was, and Paul said this, that God literally spared him from sorrow upon sorrow, compounding sorrows when he healed Epaphroditus. And here's a wonderful thing that I learned in this text. Paul was not an arrogant, aloof leader. He cared about people genuinely. And he felt the pains of ministry very deeply. There is nothing godly about being immune to pain, folks. God has not created us and designed us to be robotic. Godly people care very deeply, and they're not afraid to show it. Paul wasn't afraid to show it and express it. And verse 28 indicates that the Philippian congregation shared Paul's grief as well. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. And so Paul assumed, maybe because he had received actual reports, that they were deeply troubled when they heard that Epaphroditus was deathly ill. And that's what he meant when he said that I sent Epaphroditus back, that I may be the less sorrowful. 
The idea is that Paul knew that the Philippians were grieving over Epaphroditus' condition. In fact, uh, they very likely thought that he had died. It was that serious. And it pained Paul to know that they were grieving like this, and Paul's sorrow was only going to be relieved when they knew that he had recovered and their hearts were comforted. And it indicates that Paul knew how this church loved its own members so deeply. Now, our church is learning and growing continually, but I'm so thankful for how warm our church is in its care of its members for one another. This church cares for its own. We weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And I pray that that never lessens, but that it only deepens more and more and more with time. And that we continue to grow in that. And God is clear that a church must be a place where we carry each other's burdens. And we feel each other's pains. And we glory in each other's joys. And a church is a vitally connected body if it's functioning properly. Not just a place that we attend for a couple of hours a week and then go our separate ways. And if that's the extent of your interaction with your church, then you are missing some of the most vital purpose and function of that church. And we also see sincere love in that Epaphroditus and Paul longed for the Philippians' joy. And we just talked about Paul's concern for the Philippians in verse 28. Paul grieved that they were grieving over Epaphroditus. And verse 26 says that Epaphroditus shared their concern. It says, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. And, and, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole too far here, but you know, some of us are sympathetic criers, right? We see somebody else that's really hurting and it just, just pulls at our heartstrings and we automatically almost start crying as well. And, uh, and, and that's okay, at least in this context, because we can see this, this deeply intertwined affection and love that God's people ought to have for each other, and especially that people that are united together within the same church should have for each other. This verse expresses really the thought process which led to Epaphroditus' early return. And once he had fully recovered, Paul could see that Epaphroditus, notice these words, it says that he longed after you all. He longed for his church family. He longed for them. Uh, he missed them. And I'll tell you this, that I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say to you folks that I terribly miss being here if I'm not here for a church service. If I'm not here with this assembly, anytime that I can't be here with my church, I long for you folks. And, and that's appropriate. And to make matters worse, it says that Epaphroditus was also full of heaviness knowing that they were grieving over his illness. And when the, the, the statement full of heaviness, it comes from a very strong Greek verb. In fact, the only other place that this Greek verb is used in the New Testament is in the Gospels when they describe the heaviness that Jesus Christ himself experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prepared for the crucifixion and his upcoming separation from God the Father as he would pay the price for all of our sins. That's pretty serious grief. That's serious agony. Jesus went through that. Paul indicated that that's what's going on here in the separation, the longing, and the heaviness from a church member being apart from their church. It weighed so heavily on both Paul and Epaphroditus that verse 25 says, Paul supposed it necessary. In other words, this was not an optional matter. This wasn't just, well, maybe a best practice to be to send him back. No, it's absolutely necessary. You've got to get back to your church. And so he sent Epaphroditus home. And again, this just serves as another confirmation and an illustration of the kind of care and investment that we should have in the church to which the Lord has added us. A church should be closer than family. It is a body with each member having a critical contribution and service to perform if the church is going to work right. And the whole church, I can attest to this, the whole church feels it when a member is not with it. And there will be a great heaviness in the heart of any properly thinking church member if they're not able to be with their church. And so listen here, folks. Please hear me out. There is something weak, sickly, anemic about a church member who is careless about his or her absence from their church. A member who prioritizes other things above the Lord and their vital connection to their church is spiritually unhealthy and spiritually immature. Epaphroditus longed for his church. 
And it's one reason that, uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the, the modern concept of having multiple services where a church membership splits up and um, comes together at, at different times from one another, right? How can a church be a body if they never come together with a portion of their church? That's a problem. And it's also why I'm not a big fan of a church building all of its fellowship around segregated ministry groups. And yes, we all need close friends. And yes, discipleship does require close and intimate time spent with certain people. But splitting a church up into separate youth and adult and single and married and men's and women's and senior groups uh, does not integrate the whole body together. A church is one body, not 10 bodies or 25 or 50 bodies. And the body needs all those parts to be working together. And so we lose something vital when we only fellowship with or connect with a portion of the church that God's at us to. No, God calls us to share a deep bond amongst all of us. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26 states very plainly, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And so let's give thanks for the love and the community and the intimacy that we enjoy here. It's a gift that not all churches enjoy. And let's never take it for granted. But instead, let's work together to make it even stronger, even healthier, even more vibrant. And if you aren't tied as closely to your church as what I'm describing today, get there. Get there. The third major application in this passage is that we must honor each other. And verse 29 gives the Philippians two commands about how they must handle Epaphroditus' homecoming. Right? Don't miss this. First, Paul urged them to receive him in the Lord with all gladness. And the application for us is that we must deeply fellowship as brethren. Uh, you know, we would, we would naturally assume that any group of people would happily welcome home somebody who just returned from a 1,600-mile round-trip journey during which he almost died. <laughs> you know, we, we see communities do this sort of thing all the time when a service member returns from deployments. But Paul asked for something even more than that. He specifically told them, receive him in the Lord. In other words, Welcome him as a brother, as a precious family member, and offer to him all the joy, all the security, all the comfort that comes with a deep family relationship. We all know that it's a real blessing to be in a context where there is absolute acceptance and security. And of course, I'm not talking about turning a blind eye to sin or to faults, because true love is willing to wound a friend for his good, according to the scriptures. But even through sins and faults, true love remains faithful. It remains dependable. You can count on those people no matter what happens. They'll always be there. and They'll always have your back because their love runs that deeply for you. And that's what Paul wanted Epaphroditus to experience when he got back home to Philippi. His arrival should feel like a triumphant victorious return. Uh, The church, as Paul is indicating, should have some fanfare over this event. It should be somewhat like coming home for Christmas if, if you're away from your family or from those that are close to you. No matter how long you've been gone and no matter what has happened in the meantime, there is a rest and a security and a joy in coming home at the holidays to your family, right? Or at least hopefully that's the case with your family. Because you know that there's deep love and there, there's, there is tremendous security that's found there. Let's be a church like that. As we seek to minister for the Lord in this community and throughout the world, let's, let's model what Paul uh, instructed the Philippian church in the, the joyful, victorious reception of God's servants as they return from their missions. Let's have each other's backs. Let's love each other. Let's make sure that this is a place um, and that each of us are people to whom our brothers and sisters can come and be totally secure and deeply loved and treasured. Why? (laughs) Well, because we're here with family. Uh, We're here as part of a body that needs one another and that deeply cares for one another. And While the primary context that we're looking at is the way that a church itself should operate, you should also strive for that kind of rest in every other relationship of which you are a part. 
Make your home and your marriage a place of security. Love each other in the Lord. Be faithful, be dependable, be loyal, and even if it's not returned, be a dependable man or woman of God like Epaphroditus at work and everywhere else that you go. And the second command that Paul gave in verse 29 regarding Epaphroditus' homecoming is this, hold such in reputation. And the application for us is that we must honor godly ministers. And we're going to talk a little bit further this afternoon in um, our deacon installation service about what ministers are. We're not just talking about clergy uh, or, or somebody who is um, set on a pedestal as a, a pastor or a preacher, a missionary. Um, but ministers would be people that are servants of the Lord and um, people that have dedicated themselves to serving God and to serving their churches. And so, again, Epaphroditus probably wasn't a big personality with impressive talents. I imagine that he was just a regular, unassuming guy. And yet Paul said that he deserved a hero's welcome and he needed to be held up before his church as a hero because he faithfully fulfilled his duties all the way to the point of risking his life and his health. And we're not talking about uh, aggrandizing people as if God's not the one that really did the work through them. So please understand that. But there is a, a healthy balance between, um, between uh, praising and encouraging and comforting and, um, and being thankful for the service that people do as they submit themselves to the Lord. And still giving God the praise for the work that got done because he's the one that enabled it. And I want you to especially notice that Paul intended to establish a principle here. In other words, this is not just for Epaphroditus. This was for the church at Philippi, and this is for all of us as well in churches um, in this century in which we live. He said this, hold such in reputation. And so, in other words, we need to do the same today. As I said in my introduction this morning, this is especially important in our context where people are obsessed with so many different kinds of bigger-than-life heroes. You know, if you have kids, they'll have a tendency to get googly-eyed over some athlete or some Hollywood star or some musician or some TV character or even over a, a boy or a girl that they look up to. And they desperately want to be like that person and they want to mimic that person. And so I would challenge you, you need to intentionally set people like Epaphroditus in front of them as people who are truly worthy of honor. Read biographies with your kids about great heroes of the faith, people that gave their lives in service for the Lord. When a missionary comes through, take the time to verbally honor him to your kids for the work that he's doing. Uh, let them know he's a real hero worth emulating. And do the same with men and women of God whom you know from this church and from other churches. And then hold up everyday heroes like Epaphroditus to them. Remind them that the real hero is not Batman or Spider-Man or Patrick Mahomes or some famous actor or actress or some other personality. Remind them continually, folks, and be reminded yourself that the real hero by God's estimation, is that man over there serving for the sake of the gospel. Let them know that their teacher at church or their deacon or a missionary is a much bigger deal than Superman or LeBron James or some other famous personality that they look up to. Now, of course, <clears throat> helping them to think that way all begins with valuing those things yourself. And so I would ask every single person here, who do you want to be like? Who do you look up to? Who do you honor? I hope that you long to be like the godly servants in our church and those from other churches who have faithfully and unassumingly poured their lives out for God more than you desire any other pursuit in life. Folks, pursuing career, fame, recreation, experiences, a pampered life, a cushy retirement, those are all temporal delusions that will destroy your spiritual potential. Live for something of eternal value. Aspire to be like godly, faithful role models. But don't just dream about being like them. Pour yourself into that pursuit and become an everyday spiritual hero yourself. You know, the great thing about Epaphroditus is that every single person here in this room today can be just like him.
grow selfless love and dependability and commitment. Throw yourself into the ministry with all your energy. Sacrifice and give up anything necessary. You may never have anybody write a book about you or even a blog post about your service. You may never be recognized by this world, but you will make a difference in what really matters and the Lord will see. And ultimately, that's what really counts. And if you've lived your life for the wrong things and aspiring to the wrong goals and the wrong ambitions, won't you confess that to the Lord today and begin afresh? I'd love to talk to you further about how your sins can be forgiven and how you can submit your life to Jesus Christ so that it can actually be meaningful. And I'd also love to talk further to those who are already saved about how your life can really count for Jesus Christ beginning right here, right now this morning. And so my challenge to you is this. Won't you submit everything to the Lord Jesus Christ today? Would you bow with me? Father, we give you thanks for this simple text of Scripture, for the wonderful truths that come out of it. We thank you for the examples that you set before our eyes, men like Epaphroditus, who seemingly was just an everyday common uh, man, a church member, not somebody super flashy, super well-educated, or even mentioned outside this text. And yet a man who made such a tremendous difference in Paul's life and in his church and in the lives of potentially countless other souls for eternity. Lord, may you help each one of us to be submitted in such a way to yield all and to serve you. And I pray that, uh, that you would have your will in every single heart here today. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to close out with a song today, and I always want to give an opportunity if the Lord has ministered to your heart in some way and you need to make something right with the Lord or commit something to the Lord or confess something to the Lord, you can do that right, right there where you sit or right where you stand as we sing a song together. Um, but we're going to sing a song that really just points us to the application of what we've considered from this text today. Jonathan, what number is it? Number 440. All right, number 440. Would you all take a hymnal, stand together with us, and let's sing this hymn. Uh, it's called Jesus Calls Us. And uh, sing this together from your hearts today. appreciate your attention this morning and your reverence towards God's word as we've studied together. I pray that you are blessed by it. If we do have a meal to follow, if you're interested in staying, we'd love to be able to share that together with you. And then at 1.30, we'll gather back up here um, for the, uh, the service this afternoon. All right, would you please bow with me one more time and we'll ask the Lord's blessing as we dismiss. Father, we ask that you would um, kindly dismiss us with your blessing. We do continue to pray for the, uh, the powerful work of your word in each and every heart and that every heart would leave here in total submission to you. And I pray that you bless the meal to follow our time of fellowship. May it be glorifying to you as we talk of spiritual matters, as we talk of Christ and, and glory and what he's done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.